So let me turn to uh, to Burke Stewart. And uh, when Burr and I talked, one of the things that really got me was uh, Burr said, uh, well, you know, there, there is sometimes when prototype is just not fun. So Burr, welcome. So um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Jim asked me to do a, a sort of a follow-up talk on, well, when does modeling the prototype stop being fun? And I, I would rather do the a larger panel discussion, but I, I'm just going to throw out some provocative ideas about how you can go astray. And in a way, it's not that different from, um, you know, if, if you've uh, looked at Lance Mintime's new book on scenery, one of the things he talks about is some of the mistakes you can make just by picking the wrong color of green, and then it throws off your whole realism. And this is maybe I'm just saying some of the mistakes I think I've made um, that that reduce the amount of fun uh, from from modeling the prototype. So I'll start uh, start just with this background point. Uh, why why do we play with trains? There are all these different focus areas. You know, rail fanning is a lot of fun. Model building, which you you do a lot in this uh, forum, uh, collecting, which I think is a lot of fun. I know a lot of people love collecting stuff. Uh, you know, I never saw a train that I didn't want in my collection, even though I try to have some discipline about that. It's certainly a lot of fun. And then operating can be a lot of fun, but it's also really scary sometimes for people. So I just want to, um, I just want to talk about what I've noticed when copying the prototype faithfully can interfere with the fun. Uh, that you can have, especially with operations, but I'll talk about some of the layout design issues as well. Um, let's go forward. Oh, and a key point in this whole thing is fun for whom? The operator or the visitor or the layout owner? And uh, one of the things I've noticed is I've done a lot of things for my own fun, which just make things complicated and annoying for the people that come to run trains here. And so that's part of what I also want to alert you to. So first of all, in terms of operations, uh, during COVID, when we were all kind of locked down and freaked out, Cal Sexsmith did a nice article in the Layout Design SIG Journal about modeling Victoria, British Columbia prototypically. And he listed all of the different industries there and what tracks they were on. And I thought, you know, I could just build a three track n scale layout with two switches and some cards to indicate these prototypical locations and do some switching, just use colored dots for the different uh, industries. Numbers in the dots for the different uh, spots on the, on the three tracks. And believe it or not, this took me about 45 minutes to switch this layout. And I just had a blast that entire 45 minutes. I was sitting by myself with this one engine and these three tracks. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. Um, so don't let prototypical operations scare you. Just try it. You know, it's it can be it can be a lot of fun. Um, and uh, this is the uh, the class lecture, I guess you could say, but I, there are a lot of ap approaches to operations, and I just want to uh, briefly mention them in case you're not familiar. At the simple level, you can just bring a train into a town, and if you see a boxcar at a siding, you can pick up the boxcar, and if you see a boxcar in your train, you can put the boxcar in your train in the siding. You don't have to know what uh, the car number is. You don't have to know what's in the car, you don't have to know anything, you just swap similar car types. And this is a lot of fun. A lot of people do this for their operations. Uh, you can also make a car order for each spot in each industry by car type. And then you can have some cards that you uh, f switch around between the yard and the uh, industries to make a little bit more realistic type of movement. But again, you still don't have to look at the car number, which is really great if you're an N scale, for example. <laughs> but you're getting a little bit more prototypical. And then, of course, there's the famous sticky dots or uh, car tabs, um, which I think, if I recall, John Allen used to use them. And 
Um, many people still do in a variety of ways. I've, I've been playing around with it myself just for fun. And uh, it's a pretty easy thing. You just uh, see the color uh, on the tab and you know where to take the car. Again, you don't need to know what the car uh, number is. And then, of course, we get to the car cards and waybills, where you make a card for the car and you make a waybill that sits in the pocket of the card. And you can have an incredibly realistic operation by having all sorts of movements described in these waybills that can be as prototypically accurate as you have time to do the research for. Now, in a, once you have figured out all that research, you can handwrite switch lists for each train based on waybills that are either in car cards or in some other form. And of course, the um, computers get pulled in to track car locations and print out switch lists. So you don't have to handwrite the switch lists and you don't have to handle car cards. You can just have a printout from a computer telling you what to do. So this is the sort of range of operations approaches that we typically see. And what you or your operators find fun may have to do with a number of factors. And so one of them is your learning style. And as you probably know, 60% of us have a visual learning style where we like to see things, diagrams and so forth. I'm a, me a mechanical engineer and I'm used to seeing drawings and charts and so forth all my life. This is how I, I think. And then there are 30% of us that are uh, auditory learners, meaning we need to read it or hear it uh, in, in a linear way. Um, you know, with sentences and syntax and so forth. And I would guess that a lot of computer programmers are like this too, because if you think about a computer program, it's a very linear set of instructions. Um, and then the 10% of us are called kinesthetic learners, which the only way we learn something is to just get our hands dirty and do it. And if we do it, we can learn it. And of course, that um, it, it is a small group, but it is an important thing to remember that some people are not going to respond to either maps or visual things or written materials. They're only going to respond to take that train and move it over there with those cars. Um, of course, the other thing that really interferes with fun in an operating session is how much time pressure you're under. And a lot of us who host operating sessions do a lot of things to try to slow everyone down because they tend to just pressure themselves to get the work done quickly. Now, one of my favorite ideas I got from Joe Green was to set all my locomotives to 30 miles an hour maximum speed so that you can't really go anywhere very fast because the engine simply won't move that fast. Um, and of course, the other big thing is where are you on the learning curve? And there is more than one learning curve. There's learning about the prototype. There's learning about my particular railroad. There's learning about uh, how to use DCC decoders, you know, you name it. There's all kinds of learning curves. And um, I remember going downstairs after an operating session one day and and looking around at where everything was and discovering that uh, one one pair of operators had taken a train to the completely wrong end of the layout. Uh, you know, and it was in the staging yard. It was just in the wrong staging yard. I was thinking, wow, that's that's amazing. <laughs> but the, on the, where they were on the learning curve, they they still hadn't really figured out which staging yard represented which, uh, you know, destination. Um, so uh, just briefly to characterize what I think is a difference between car cards and waybills versus computerized switch lists, getting a little bit off the tangent, but I promise to get back on it, is it, for for car cards and waybills, the car forwarding data is on the layout in on the waybills in the car cards. Whereas in a computerized switch list, all the car forwarding data is on the computer and there isn't any information on the layout about what cars are supposed to be doing, except what's printed out in the switch list. Um, with car cards, the people uh, figure out what work to do because they grab the car cards, they figure out which ones need to go in their train based on the destination. Uh, whereas in a computerized switch list, the computer figures out what to do and simply gives you a switch list telling you to do it. Now, um, in between sessions, the restaging 
is a, a fun, I find it a fun hands-on activity where I've got car cards, I've got cars, locomotives, and I've got to, you know, figure out if I can flip the waybills to a different destination, change out the locomotives, whatever is needed to be done. Now with a computerized switch list, the people do whatever the computer tells them, whether or not it makes sense. And if they don't do it right, you've got a big reconciliation job to figure out how to get the computer to understand where the cars actually ended up. Um, and so the, in my uh, very uh, biased opinion, um, with car cards, crews can keep their car cards in train order so they know exactly what is happening, what's supposed to happen. It's very easy to set up a block of cars for various destinations. And with um, computer switch lists, the cars are listed in random order on the switch list, and you spend all your time trying to reconcile what is on the switch list versus what is in your train versus what is in the sightings. And I personally have never found this even remotely fun. I find it a huge headache. And I think the reason is that I'm a visual learner and there's nothing visual about a switch list. It's simply a, like a reading um, a poem or something. You know, it's a document with a whole bunch of lines of text. And so it's a, you know, you can say it's a matter of preference. And I'm also saying it's, it's kind of a matter of learning style or something like that. So here's an example of one of my car cards. The purple tells you that it's in the purple town, Sky Comish, and it's a, you know, obviously it's a hopper going to a gravel quarry. And um, if you're working a yard, each track has uh, a box and each of these car cards represents where the trains are supposed to go and the car cards are in train order. And you can see a little bit here, there's a, on the left, there's a, a blue, a blue group, and you can see the um, little header there for blue is northbound. And so all those cars need to go northbound. And these ones do too. So you can see these two uh, tracks, the cars need to be combined into one train. And behind them, there are some red cars that need to go south and they'll be combined. So um, on some other layouts I've seen, you, you have something you know that called a handwritten switch list which is supposedly more prototypical. Now, I get that prototype um, crews used handwritten switch lists. I do understand that that is prototypical. But if you're dealing with this switch list, you have to figure out where are these cars in your train? Because there's no, there's no guarantee that the list is in train order. And so, like I said, you're you're into a mind game. And of course, the next level of this is a computer printout. And this is my own attempt to use JMRI ops for my N scale layout. And this is just an example of a printout that it gave me. And I did, you can see from all these check marks that I did succeed in getting most of the way through this switch list. And actually, if if memory serves, I did get all the way through it, but I didn't enjoy myself. I mean, I kept looking to say, okay, wait, this box car is where, and paper shipping outside is where, and okay, and here I changed for some reason, I changed the destination. Um, and, and then I discovered that there was a, a the wrong car was, was on in my train, it had the wrong car number. So then I had to go look for the car number. So I was just wasting a bunch of time getting this done. And I didn't find it fun. Now, somebody would say, well, but the program was giving you a bunch of very realistic random destinations for these cars. And you didn't have to flip a waybill and every four times repeat yourself. And there's, you know, that's true, sort of. But I don't really have any confidence in the random nature of what the computer program was doing. It wasn't a bunch of shippers um, ordering cars. And so I anyway, that's the end of my rant about how much I prefer car cards to computer switch lists, but I know there's a lot of people who are using them and those layout owners are spending a lot of time behind computer screens trying to keep everything reconciled and I'm not doing any of that. I'm having fun with my layout and all my car cards, just making sure everything's staying, you know, together. And again, back to the visual thing, this is the, um, the, the color map of the layout 
and you can see my sky comish area uh, way bill is going to the purple sky comish which is on the very uh, east end of the railroad and so no matter where you're operating here if you have a car card with the purple on it you know it needs to go towards the left and end up here in sky comish so somewhere in here in the green zone you need to get it shifted over so that it can get to sky comish on this route um and uh, well uh some people feel that car cards is like switching color dots you know it's not prototypical and I, I'm just saying with the learning curve challenges of everybody, it's very helpful to have a color scheme that people can understand. And I particularly like this one um, because it the 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 geographically the hot the warm colors are to the south and the cold colors are to the north. So the and the 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 forest colors are right in the middle of the layout. So it's not too hard to figure out when you're we're sorting cars where you're supposed to be sending them. Um, so now I'm just going to give some other examples of uh, prototype, uh, getting carried away with prototype modeling. So this is a picture of the prototype north end of Inner Bay Yard. And it's, it's a place I've done a lot of rail fanning. And I was always fascinated by how the yard, which is behind us in this picture, went from four tracks to two tracks. And these two switches were right next to each other. And I thought, gosh, if I could model four tracks going to two tracks and those two tracks going out of town as they do <clears throat> excuse me um that would be really cool that would be a signature piece of track work that everybody would recognize and i would feel really good about how i was modeling the prototype and i built this on my north end of my inner bay yard just like this and i was very very pleased with myself and what ended up happening and th this is uh, a little bit later after I modified it, but I had, you can see I had the four tracks here going down to two tracks and these two switches were parallel to each other, just like they were in the prototype. And like I say, every time I looked at this, I said, I know where that is. It's exactly like the prototype. It's very cool. Well, after a few operating sessions and they were absolutely chaotic, and you can see the inner bay yard here. The track work I was showing you before is behind us in the photograph. It was very clear that this yard master could not possibly keep up with the traffic unless we had a yard lead for these uh, for this ladder for all this switching and so what we did was to uh, if i back up for a second we added uh, a couple of, uh, we added a switch in here so that we could extend the yard lead way way out past so if i had, if i made a mark here on the prototype photo we put we inserted a switch here and we ran the yard lead way out here. So we have three tracks going out towards the Salmon Bay Bridge instead of two. And that's totally unprototypical. But boy, does it improve the operations and make the whole thing a lot more fun for everybody. So the yard master can be drilling this yard continuously while various other trains are going in and out of the arrival departure tracks and so forth. My second example is the town of Everett. And I did an article in the Layout Design Journal 43 in the summer of 2011 about this, if you wanna look that up. But this is one of the most complicated and interesting railroad towns you'll ever find. There's a double track main line coming up from Seattle towards Everett. And the main line to Chicago heads through a tunnel over to Lowell and then east to Spokane and eventually um, Billings and, um, um, Minneapolis and so forth, the old Great Northern Main Line. And, and then uh, this, the second track runs up along the, the, the coast of the, of the town and around to the Delta Y, where if you go left, you go to Vancouver. If you go right, you go into this huge Delta Yard, and then you can proceed toward Chicago again. And I did an enormous amount of track planning to try to figure out how on earth I would fit this into a peninsula on my layout. And eventually, um, I came up with a plan, which is my, very much of a compromise, um, but it did it did sort of do the job. At least I had the Y, the Delta Y, so the train could come into Bayside Yard. It could go left to go to Vancouver, and it could go right to go to Chicago. Now, this is a picture from the Great Northern Railway Historical Society of the actual track alignment in Bayside, which, as you can see here, is even more complicated than the diagram that we had in the in the publication. There was actually two yards along the shore, 
one of them was for the Scott paper mill. And that was this one. And the other one was for the um, uh, various other industries that were up uh, to the north, the north end. So there were industries up here that were served by this end, and there were a big paper mill that was served down here. Two yards, one after another. And of course, there was also a passenger station down here before the um, two split. Now, if I turn that upside down, I can show you what I ended up doing, which is lapped yards. And if you've heard of a lapped siding, it's a siding with a crossover in the middle, except that the main line goes uh, straight through and the siding, one siding is on each side. And uh, I just saw something in the Model Railroad Planning 2007. Dave Hussman did a nice little sidebar on uh, the advantages of lapped sidings. Uh, anytime you put a crossover in the middle of a siding, you have a whole bunch of additional operational advantages, even if the prototype didn't have one. So what I ended up doing, and since I didn't have room to do one yard after the other, was to put one yard on one side and one yard on the other side. And um, I, this is not prototypical. And I mean, the point of my talk is sometimes varying from prototype can be more fun than copying the prototype religiously. And furthermore, the, if you see here, the main line is on the back of the yard, on both yards. But I wanted to see the main line trains run through. So we put the main line in the front so the main line would come along. And then we have all the switching behind the main line. And then, of course, the other thing is this was where the uh, Scott paper mill was. And that would mean putting that up here in the aisle. So I put the Scott paper mill in the back where I had room for some tracks. Uh, and again, that's not prototypical, but it we still are handling all of these wonderful wood chip cars and we're making toilet paper, uh, you know, every time we operate here. So um, <laughs> it doesn't matter that it's on the wrong side of the aisle. And, and you know, I've, I've thought a lot about, well, why don't I just put in some trackage here and put the Scott paper mill in front of the main line? And I keep thinking, I don't want to block the view of all these main line trains. And yeah. so anyway, that's just a, a good example. And for just to end this this uh, issue, this is a view of the current uh, yard. And uh, you can see the uh, the Scott yeah, the Scott Yard here and the new yard on the left there with the Port of Everett. And you can also see the wood chip cars here that we have inside. But I also, my wife and I do a lot of swing dancing with big bands and, the, and, and I wanted to really celebrate how much fun social dancing is. So I put a big dance hall right out here by the station and there's no prototype station here, but we do want the passenger trains when we run them we want them to stop at a station so i put the station in the wrong place but right in front of the action so everybody can see these dancers and i can proselytize you know to everyone who sees the layout about how much fun dancing is forget about model railroading <laughs> so anyway um these are just examples of you know having fun and not getting too slavish about copying the prototype and i showed you this before the the sort of if people don't necessarily want to keep track of all that information, but at least here, right in front of the Bayside Yard, we have the black dot saying, this is where you are. If you go to the left, you're only going to go to Bellingham or Skycomish. If you go to the right, you're going to go to all these other places. And these are the colors. So, you know, this hopefully helps make it simple enough that people can have fun with it. So another example is how much fun are spot numbers or track numbers? And, you know, the, the, there's no answer to that question. Uh, it, it can be a lot of fun. This is the prototype Lone Star Cement in South Seattle, which I've loved looking at and always wanted to model. And I eventually did put this in the layout. I'm unspeakably proud of how cool this is. I've got the three tracks, just like the prototype, the silos, I mean, we still aren't done, obviously, but we've got the four tracks that are on the prototype and they're full of the same cars. And I just love it. And we've got the tracks labeled Lone Star 1, 2, 3, and 4. And that's cool, right? So here's the, the car card boxes for Lone Star Cement 
track one, two, three, and four. And if you look at these waybills that have all been spotted here, that these are the ones we see in the picture, you can see the track two has waybills that say Lone Star Cement 2. And track three says Lone Star Cement 3. Isn't, isn't this amazing? Lone Star Cement 4. Somebody actually did the job of spotting all these cars into the correct track. And I don't know if they had fun doing it or not. I just was amazed at the end of the op session that this was so well done by somebody who loves switching. And, I, you know, that's what this is about, right? Yep. But I asked myself, wait a minute. Does the prototype care what tracks these cars run? They're just empty cement hoppers. They're going to fill them up and they'll have a way bill saying where they're supposed to be shipped. But for bringing in the cars to the plant, I shouldn't be labeling these for specific tracks, let alone spot numbers. What am I going to do? Say, put this car before that car, before that car. Like, it doesn't make any difference. They're just going to load them full of cement. You see what I'm saying? It's like we get carried away with, oh, we can, we can make sure the right car gets on the right track. And I'm just thinking, yeah, I think there are times it's fine to just say, throw 15 cars at that plant and just stick them on the loading tracks and call it good don't worry about which car which track it's on so for another completely different thought how many depressed center flats are prototypical on a layout and this is timely because um, um, class one model works is doing a huge amount of uh, hyper marketing right now about their brand new um, depressed center flat cars and I, I succumbed and bought two of them. I, I'm, I'm so excited with myself, even though I already had a perfectly good Burlington Northern Walther's depressed center flat car. And I remember an article from Tony Thompson where he analyzed freight car fleets. And you know how good he is at doing that. And he came up with the very unwelcome information that, um, uh, a typical layout should have fewer than one depressed center flat car statistically. Now, fortunately, even though he said that, I have a prototype photo here that I took right outside my office window one day of the Burlington Northern Main Line with no less than three of these beautiful depressed center flats with um, loads. And, you know, this proves that it's okay for me to have three depressed center flats, even though Tony said fewer than one would be prototypically accurate for your fleet. So I want you to, I'm not saying go out and buy a four pack of those depressed center flats, but it, you know, it's all about fun, right? So for my next example, and I'm almost done, um, there's a car repair shed in the inner bay yard, which I always enjoy. And if you've ever rail fanned in Seattle, you've seen this car repair shed. It's a big operation. They repair cars all over the northwest part of the country. And I thought, I have to model this. It's right next to the yard that I'm modeling. And so the question is, is it a signature scene or is it an impediment? So I made this beautiful model, like I said before about the cement plant. I'm incredibly proud of this. I just, every time I look at it, I think, wow, you are one hot shot super duper model railroader to build this and you know right in the right location you know with the tracks i mean i'm just going i know where i am i'm in inner bay yard this is extremely cool so here's a, a aerial shot of of the uh, of it as it stands today and i did a bunch of work to make all this uh, pavement as realistic as possible based on um Google uh, Maps photos and, you know, you've, there's, a, there's asphalt here and gravel here and there's a border. I mean, this is all super cool, right? And then there's some uh, maintenance of way equipment, which is very prototypical that it's here. You know where I'm going with this, right? Maybe you don't. But look at the amount of space. How many bad order cars do I need to handle in a typical operating session? I got three bays here. And, and I'm looking at this yard. And so this is the typical operating situation, right? We got the yard, the yard master is just dying to have a little more track. And I don't have room to stick the, you know, a bunch of more tracks here. But I lately, I've been thinking, wait a minute. Can you imagine if you if I move the caboose track over here, I just got rid of cut this down to like a one track car repair shed, I could move the caboose track down here. 
I could add at least two, if not three, car lengths to each one of these six cars. That would be like a whole nother 12 to 18 cars of capacity in the yard, which this yard master would just die for during an operating session. So this is an example of modeling the prototype as a signature scene without realizing that maybe the trade-off, since this is also the signature yard, this is the main yard on the whole layout, maybe having a little extra track capacity in the main yard is more important than a prototypically accurate model of a car repair shed, which is of relatively little value in, the, in terms of, an op, of operating interest. And finally, I don't know if you've seen these really cool uh, electronic waste stations by Boulder Creek Engineering, but they are super cool. They have a little uh, um, uh, LED um, infrared sensor underneath the track scale, and they give you a readout of the weight of the card based on a random number generator. And so I dutifully installed one of these and then put, uh, I think I have a picture of it, yeah, on some of my waybills, I said, weight at scale. So I, I gave a little spot for the yard master to weigh the car and put the weight of the car on there before he forwarded it on to the next location. Well, <clears throat> I'm here to say that I've had 10 or 15 operating sessions since I installed this, and it has been used twice. And it has been used twice only at the very end of an operating session, only by a very skilled yard master who was able to keep up with the work in that yard. And so I guess my point is, yes, it's cool that we have a working scale track, track scale. It's cool. And look, we have a, 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 a scale test car and we can run that thing in here. But it, it's so much work to run a big complicated layout without all these little bells and whistles that it doesn't really make any difference. So. I'm not sure if this adds to the fun or adds to the hassle. I, I, I'm just on the fence about it. And I think that's my, that's my point. Uh, uh, it was just to run my mouth a little bit about sometimes we do things because they're prototypically accurate or cool, but they don't necessarily increase the fun because there's already too much fun. It's like, when is enough fun too much? And, you know, my video, my YouTube channel is called Much Fun with Trains because I really do have a lot of fun with trains and I love sharing it with people, but you can totally sabotage yourself if you just obsess with, well, this is how the prototype did it without thinking about, well, is it fun for people to do it the way the prototype did it? And, you know, Jim, there's a, a million other examples and I'd love to hear from other people on this same topic because I think lots of people have made lots of trade-offs between what they can fit and what's fun versus what the prototype did. And I just think it's a fascinating topic. So thanks, thanks for your attention. I hope I didn't go too long. Bert, I, I agree with you. I, I think it's also a fascinating issue that, that I don't hear people talk about. Uh, I, I hear it one way or the other. It's either, well, it has to be prototypical or it's not, not correct, uh, but I don't, or it's fun and I'm a freelancer and I don't, I don't worry about it. But, but talking about the trade-offs that are necessary from an operational standpoint, from a modeling standpoint, I don't really hear people talking about that. And that's why I'm, I, I jumped at a chance to, uh, to ask you to be on the show and to start the discussion. Yep. So I thank you so much for being here. Does anybody have any questions or comments to, uh, to Bert? Bert, thanks so very yeah, Bert, much. Yeah. I do a yeah, uh, Bert, uh, interesting presentation. You uh, Early in your presentation, you said uh, like 10% of visual learners and uh, uh, others are active learners. Now, where did you get that information? Um, it's 10% it's are kinesthetic, 60% uh, are visual, and 30% are uh, auditory verbal uh, reading type learners. And I got it from some um, training class I went to, you know, at my job years ago about how to teach people how to do the job right. And, you know, it's, it's sort of standard teacher training um, research.
like how what what people respond to what type of learning tools. I mean, and, you know, it's that those numbers are. Yeah. What's that? I said I spent uh, forty years in education, thirty four at higher ed, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in teacher education, and. Yeah. Uh, I've never seen those numbers before, and dividing learners up that way uh, is really inconsistent with what the literature says. Uh, so I would take a look at that. Uh, number one, uh, we all can learn in different ways. We have tendencies or preferences that we feel more comfortable in. Uh, that's the problem with higher education of too much chalk and talk or now PowerPoint yeah. and talk. But not right. all people learn that way. Uh, right. The other thing is uh, you've got individuals also who have learning disabilities and therefore are going to have some real difficulty with the numbers that you presented because they learn differently. And yet they can function. You may have a person who is working in your organization who does the job very well and yet has learning difficulties. So I'm, I'm really cautious about those numbers there. And the thing is that there's, a, you know what Venn diagrams are? Yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of times if you, if you try to graphically show that, the different kinds of learners, there's overlap. There's overlap, even though a person is preferential to sitting and listening to a lecture and taking it all in, versus a person who says, I got to try it out. Uh, I've got to fiddle with it. I got to see my way. I got to have my failings in order to, for it to come together for me. Yeah, uh, I'm that, talking that about makes a lot of sense. So uh, I, I don't want to go on about this, but I would uh, take a real look at that um and uh uh and uh consider uh uh looking at that in terms of of how you put together your presentation uh i happen to believe i happen to be a a partner with you in the car card approach and uh the the thing i see with uh the car cards and with model railroading is too often people think of model railroading as trains. Yes, that's true. But when you look at it in terms of the larger thing, model railroads or real railroads run for economic purpose. They move stuff. Uh, a whole warehouse full of refrigerators up in Minnesota by Frigidaire or whoever builds them up there, those refrigerators have potential value. They have real value when it's in my when it's in my kitchen or your right. kitchen. Right. Uh, so therefore, value is created by moving those things. It's called place utility versus manufacturing utility, where we're changing the form of materials to create something. Transportation is place utility, and so the model railroad really ought to be run based upon the concept of place utility. Why is that stuff moved from A to B? And then how is it moved? It could be truck, it could be pipeline, it could be, et cetera. So uh, the car cards then and the way bills should be built based upon the industry and what goes on in the industry. Now, the industry needs input and the industry has output. And what are the inputs going to a particular industry, whether it be a warehouse or it be a manufacturing plant? How does the stuff get in and what is it and how does it get there? And then you have your car cards will say, all right, we're going to have a box car of X going in because that's part of the input. Or we're going to have a box car going to pick up because that's part of the output. Those are the kinds of things that make the car cards work. And I like the car card thing because the, the car card, the way bill in the car card is really giving the railroad direction on the movement of stuff. 
And, you know, so I, I, I don't want to go on any further, I, 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 but, you know, me, those I, are things I, that I, I think ought to be built in. Go ahead, excuse, Jim. Hey, excuse, excuse me so much. I hate to break in here, but we've got other segments of the show that we have to get through gotcha. tonight. What, I, what yeah. I'd what love to do is is have you back on, uh, and Bert, if you'd like to come back on, too, and talk about car cards and so forth. But I, I just don't have any more time on the show tonight. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I, Thanks, John. I apologize for having to stop it at this point, but, but you know, I have to get the other people on the show. Burr, thank you so very much. And, and like thank I say, you. if you'd like to come back and do a segment on it, please send me an email uh, so I know who you are and so forth, because I don't know who the other gentleman is that was talking. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you'll send me a, an email to jimkello at newtracksmodeling.com, then we can schedule a segment on the uh, the car cards because I do think that would be interesting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bert.